Welcome. This is Dr. Sharon Barnes on the International Wealth Builders Radio Show, and I'm so happy that you've tuned in to join us today. Uh, I'm very excited about our, our show today. We have a very special guest who's going to be talking about um, financing of various real estate uh, projects, especially uh, when it comes to accessory dwelling units. Again, this is the International Wealth Builders Radio Show with your host, Dr. Sharon Barnes. I am the owner of ADU Advantage, uh, where we provide education, resource, and, com and consultation services to help you make your accessory dwelling unit a reality. So we're here to provide information to take that thought of having an accessory dwelling unit in your backyard to a reality and um, I've talked to hundreds of homeowners and investors uh, in Southern California that want to take advantage of the new accessory dwelling unit laws. And one of the first questions they asked is, is there financing available? How can I finance it? Who can I talk to? So we're going to be dealing with these questions today. We have TR, the long guy, with us. He has years of experience in the real estate market. Uh, and loans and financing, very supportive. He's worked with me on a lot of projects from traditional buy and sell real estate transaction to uh, land development. And especially here in the last couple years, we've been uh, working together on accessory dwelling units, helping uh, homeowners actually get financing for the accessory dwelling units um, to you know, provide for a love housing for a loved one, or to um, get rental income, the accessory dwelling unit laws have really been evolving so that we can um, so that we can have um, more housing units here in um, in California, which we need. We know that we have a housing shortage throughout the country, and um, we we all need to participate. And that's what the state legislature has decided is that. The big developers cannot build us out of this housing shortage. We all need to pitch in, and I think that the accessory dwelling unit laws um, have reduced a lot of the barriers to the average homeowner um, and allowing them to build an accessory dwelling unit. And um, I think that that's going to be a great opportunity for changing the wealth dynamic of your of your family, including increasing your retirement, uh, doing college funds, and just creating generational wealth. So again, thank you for tuning in. I hope you stay um, with us throughout the remainder of the show for the uh, to one o'clock. And um, right now, we're going to ask um, T.R. the long guy to introduce himself, tell us a little bit about himself, the company, and his experience. Welcome, T.R. Thank you, Dr. Barnes. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, a little bit about myself. I have been in the mortgage arena for over 18 years. I started back in 04, got my big break with Lehman Brothers, a small business finance before they went defunct. Started as a processor, worked my way up to become an underwriter. From there, I was a team lead. I was a training partner, I actually trained underwriters. We, uh, I became an underwriting manager, also a uh, underwriting branch manager, and from there became a loan officer and then broker as we are today. Well, thank you, thank you for that, I appreciate that. And as you uh, just mentioned that you're a loan broker and a lot of our people in the audience may not understand the difference between just um, a loan officer and a loan broker. And I know we've worked some difficult situations. And <laughs> yes, we have. No matter what the circumstances are, you can tend um, to find a solution for them. So can you explain this little difference between just a loan officer and you as a broker? Well, absolutely. Um, a loan officer is a, a person who works for a traditional bank, traditional credit union, or an online finance um, institution. And before we get started, there's nothing wrong with any of those. I actually have bank accounts. I have a credit union accounts. And, but a loan officer is limited to the bank or credit union's offerings and products. They have, everyone has FHA. Everyone has a conventional um, products. And some have HELOC products. 
the difference between the loan officer and a broker is like myself, I'm a mortgage broker. I have relationships with over 30 different lenders. So when you come in, let's just say your FICO score is a little bit lower and it doesn't meet that particular bank's or credit union's program guidelines, well, I have a program for you for not so good credit. Let's say you want to build from the ground up. Well, I have construction programs with different lenders that we can get you from the ground up. If you want to put a pool in your backyard, I have a renovation loan that works for you. If, let's say, you need a reverse mortgage to limit your monthly incomes, well, we have those programs for you as well. If it can be done, we can do it. So the difference between a broker and a loan officer, a loan officer has just one product from a particular company. Brokers have multiple, multiple, multiple products from a wide variety of um, companies. So pretty much yeah. that's it. Yeah, I appreciate that because I, the way my clients have been able to benefit is that, you know, usually I refer them over to you and you do the fact finding, <laughs> you know, that you can get into the details of what they're really dealing with, what's on the credit report, mm -hmm. what their financials look like, challenges and concerns. And then from your array of options that they have, you can figure out which best fits for them. And, and I really appreciate that because a lot of them are getting turned down because the specific credit union or bank they're working with, mm -hmm. they just don't fit in, like you say, their model or their overlay. And sometimes uh, I found with uh, home assistance program or even like, you know, we got the Cal Half a Grant out there now. Yes, we and do. when things start coming out, I had a call this morning from a client, wasn't know if I knew about a program that B of A is, is doing, it just rolled out two days ago, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like you have to find the lenders who know about the program and key is willing to do that extra paperwork because <laughs> hard to, you know, I'm handling it like, I don't do home assistance because this is too much paperwork or, or whatever. And so we have to understand um, that we need to have options. And so you've been a very valuable uh, strategic partner of mine, and I just want to just put that out there and let people know there is a difference and uh, you can work with them. So appreciate that. Oh, well, I will say this, Sharon. You and I have worked together for multiple, multiple years, and all of our deals, whether they're the easy ones or the challenging ones, it's always been a great journey with you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what I can say, right? Exactly. And I always tell the clients, you want to have options. Yeah. I liken it to, backing it back up to the whole broker versus LO, you can't typically go and order a Big Mac at Burger King. <laughs> but exactly. what if you could? Right. What if you could? In this world of mortgage financing with a broker you can you can say hey this is what fits me you come to a one-stop shop and like you mentioned what if you need down payment assistance most banks and credit unions don't offer that some do but most of them don't what if you like i said you need to anything if you're a self-employed borrower but you deduct a lot of taxes a lot of expenses on your tax returns well your income on taxes are very low however we have bank statement loans that work out for you that you can now get a loan based off of your bank statements and not your tax returns. The, the deal about myself, what makes me unique, I'm a unicorn. I've been on the operation side and I've been on the origination side. So as an underwriter, as an underwriting trainer, as an underwriting manager, I know the programs. So when you call me, I tell people, use my expertise. I've been in this arena for a very long time. Use me for the knowledge. And when you come to us, I pre-underwrite every file. We look to make sure that there's nothing um, that's out of place. And so by the time we actually submit it to the underwriters, we are getting these loans closed in about 15 days. And it's been crazy. You know that. I, yeah, I've known. I've <laughs> witnessed that, that you've gotten them closed in like two weeks. And I, I want to talk a little bit because you, you mentioned the underwriter several times mm -hmm. about, you know, only working as an underwriter but training underwriters. And mm -hmm. underwriters are, are these people that we hear about and mm -hmm. that loan officers call us about, that the underwriter needs this, the underwriter's questioning that, but we never have direct contact with them. We don't understand sometimes um, the underwriting part in this invisible person. Absolutely. So can you give us a little insight as to um, what the underwriter's role is in the relationship to, to you as the broker and, and the client? 
Because that seems to be the one that we need to satisfy to get our loan approved. Absolutely. Well, you definitely have to satisfy the underwriter to get your loan approved. In relationship to the borrower, the underwriter is almost like the managing agent of the deal itself, of the, the conditions that you need to meet. And so the underwriter's deal is to look out for the best interest of the company. They want to make sure that if they lend this money, whether it's $500,000 or a million dollars, that they're in, there's nothing shady about the deal. There's no fraud involved. The person who says, hey, I want to borrow this money can pay that money back. So they're going to look at and scrutinize the deal to make sure that all the T's are crossed and all the I's are dotted. And that's what the underwriter says. He's going to look for your income. He's going to calculate your assets, make sure you have the appropriate amount of assets to close. He's going, or he or she is going to look at um, the property profile, the title report, to make sure that there's nothing on title that's standing out, any judgments or anything like that. Um, make sure that you are who you say you are, looking at your social security to make sure everything matches the file. I mean, just right. to the T, to the okay? A exactly. So that's what you got to go through now. And today's standards, now, underwriters are a little bit different than they were back in the day. We had to do a lot more back in the day years ago. And now you have underwriters who are coming on. It's no fault of their own, but they're new. And so they're going by what they were taught, and they're really st sticking to just the basics. They're not thinking outside of the box. Well, that's why you have somebody like me to think outside the box for you. And when they ask for items, if that item is not according to guidelines, I'm saying, hey, this is the guidelines that Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or FHA has in this regard. Why do you ask me for that? Why do we need that? We don't have to burden the borrower with that particular condition because it's not part of the guidelines. Okay. You would like to have it, but it's not required. Exactly. Exactly. I appreciate that. And and one of the last things that I just want to mention before we go to break is that one thing that I've seen you do that I haven't had the experience with, with other um, loan officers and I, or at least I haven't got the feedback from clients, is that because of your background, well, if you kind of anticipate what the underwriter is going to look for, you know, and so you're very proactive, and you want <laughs> you don't like to piecemeal a loan package. You like to get everything there, and then sometimes the client understand why is he asking for this before it's even requested, and I just think that's an asset and not necessarily a detriment, but people don't always um, appreciate that. But I, I think that um, your insight into the underwriting world mm -hmm. and being able to an anticipate and have those conversations that you reference has definitely helped you close deals in, in oh, 15 yeah. days mm -hmm. versus 30 or 45. And, you know, as a realtor, I understand we have a 45-day escrow, and then on day 43, we're begging for 10 more days for some reason. Sometimes it might be um, documentation that's needed that um, the buyer, the borrower couldn't find. But a lot of time is that we weren't as proactive and we got these conditions mm -hmm. that came out sideways that we only found out about on day 41 instead of day exactly. two. Exactly. <laughs> and just to give you a, a case, we just closed one. It was 10 days in yeah. 10 days. I remember talk, talking to you about that. So mm -hmm. it can be done. It doesn't take forever to get a loan um, accepted and processed. Every lender is different. But uh, we want to, again, bring you resources like TR, the loan guy, on how he can help you. We're going to take a quick break now. When we come back, we'll continue to talk about real estate funding and um, uh, what's out there, especially with the current interest rates. And we'll just talk general, but stay with us, and we'll be back shortly. Mm -hmm. 